Hello everyone and I am your host Ingrid Thompson and welcome to So You Want to Start a Business episode number 71. Our guest today is Travis Jones. Strap yourself in because he has so much to say about just about everything. And to get us started, here's what he had to say about pricing. It's the experience you deliver that dictates how much you can charge. And then it's going, okay, what's the business model? What like sits true with me? And for us, it's like we wanted one-on-one support. We wanted to deliver that experience. So for us, and then we, we work our margins first, and that's what our price works out to be. So it's understanding the margins and the cash flow. Well, there you have it. That's Travis about pricing and value. Travis and I spent about an hour together, and this podcast is pretty much every minute of our conversation. Towards the end, he talks about the things that have made him successful. I always ask, what are the three things that make you successful? And he said that charisma was one of those, and it is certainly true. This is a fun interview, and I truly believe you will enjoy it. So settle in to meet Travis. As always, this episode is brought to you by my book with the same name as the podcast, So You Want to Start a Business. No other advertising here. Head over to where you buy your books online for the Kindle or the physical book. If you're a regular listener and don't already have your copy, you know that there's a taste of what the book is about over at www.thestartupsteps.com and there's an extract of the first 20 pages. The full audio version will be coming soon, although as a special treat, you may want to cycle back to episode number 70 where there is an extract read by me of chapter one. Anyway, enough about me and my book. Let's listen to what Travis has to say about starting his own business and so much more. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, and here we are today with Travis Jones from RBT Gyms. Travis, hello. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for so much for having me on here today. I'm really looking forward to that chat. Yeah, I think some of our listeners are just going to get so much value from what you've got to say. So let's start. What is your business? Uh, essentially, the first business that we started was RBT Gyms. So we're at 21 locations across two uh, countries at the moment. So that's fantastic. Just slow uh, that down. 21 <laughs> locations. Yeah, 21 locations um, over the last eight years. Um, yeah. There's been some a bit of a grind along the way, and we're, we're still growing, which is fantastic. And um, the spin-offs to that business is we have a digital agency called Attain Digital, which helps um, RBT plus other businesses acquire clients. So uh, essentially it's ROI, ROI based marketing. And then also the spinoff for that was our, um, our coaching. So we help uh, health based businesses. So the fitness and Pilates and yoga style businesses grow to that million dollars and beyond. And that's our niche that we sort of sit in. So that's the, the three core businesses that we sort of sit between. And, you know, one grew because, you know, essentially we needed to continue the lead generation. We couldn't find a company to be able to help um, give the amount of leads that we need on a monthly basis. And the other one grew because everyone kept asking me for help. <laughs> um, yeah. Three businesses. <laughs> yeah. Teach us what you've done it's because we want to yeah. do it too. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Okay. So you said eight years ago, so you started the first business, RBT Gyms, eight years ago? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And why? Why um, did you worked, start? Yeah. yeah. I was working in a big box gym. And um, so there's, you know, thousands of members, you know, you know, we all know the big box gyms as the fitness first and the anytime fitnesses and all that. And I was working inside one of those and I saw everyone coming into the, the gym and what happens there is there's an 80% no-show rate. So there's an 80% of members are non-active and only 20% of members are actually using that membership. And I said, like, am I really making an impact in the health and fitness industry? Like, I got in here to change lives. I got in here to, you know, make a difference. And I was training my, you know, I was a personal trainer, and I am. Um, like, I was training my 20, 30 people. I did it in a little semi-private environment. So I trained, like, four at once. I sort of sat in the corner by myself. Um, you are the sum of the five people and I didn't really have any sur- anyone really surrounded by myself to lift me up and I looked at everyone they're walking in no one even greet each other really they just go stand on a treadmill or you know the girls the females would walk into the weights room feeling intimidated and yeah, I was just like this environment isn't actually transforming lives this environment isn't conducive to results and all it is it's a cash machine um, so I was like I don't want to be a part of this anymore. So mm. within six weeks, I was like, that's it. I'm opening my own thing. And my first ever numbers were, I'm going to get 216 members. They're going to pay me $50 a week. I'm going to make 570000 a year. But I'm going to change these 216 lives, right? And that was my first ever numbers um, that I sort of made. I walked up to like, I, was, I was, had no money either. 
So I, I walked up to 51 people and asked them for a $25,000 investment in 4% of that first location. The 52nd person said yes. Um, so it was a lot of asking um, and not much um, you know, leeway, but the 52nd person said yes. And I sold my car. I moved into the first location with my dog, Hercules. And you know that was the first year of my life. I, I was, and my marketing back then was like walking the streets. And I was like, I just knew that people were going to be in a park at lunchtime so I walked up to like 100 people every single week and I offered them a free trial into my business it was like a 28 day challenge and I knew if I walked up to 100 people a week 80 would say no 20 would say yes and if I did those numbers I would get me to where I needed to be it wasn't smart marketing but it was what I knew back then yeah and you know what it was probably really genuine in terms of it was you eyeball to eyeball smiling i mean we're yeah. watching each other now in the video yeah, yeah. you know it's your personality and you know it, yes there's more sophisticated ways of doing it but a personal trainer is just that a personal trainer so it's that connection so you know yeah. it might not have been the smartest marketing but those people knew who they were going to be dealing with when they came to your gym I 100% agree with you. Like so many people these days that we you know we're talking about, are you B to B or are you B to C? I was like, no, I'm H to H, like human to human. Like that's yeah. who I am. And yeah. it doesn't matter. Like back then, yeah, I was literally human to human relationships, but even through social media now, or even through like this, you know, it's having, it's knowing that it's not a number. I'm literally connecting with a person on the other end that's a human being. They have emotions, they have feelings, they have their own things they're dealing with. So yeah. I want to connect to a human. And I think that for us, that's always what I wanted. I wanted the opposite. I wanted an 80% show rate. And that's how we've built our business. It's that we tried to look at what the industry was doing eight years ago and I wanted to flip it on its head. I wanted to create a community-driven gym. It was only 250 members. You know, the, 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 essentially the cost was a little bit higher, but everyone trained in a group training environment, but I had the one-on-one -on -one accountability from a personal trainer who checked in with them each week. And that, I think that's the difference from where we went with the business. Mm -hmm. um, so they had that contact. If they didn't show up to that session, they would get that text message, get that call. And they're like, oh, the people actually care about my results. Yeah. And that's the difference. That's where I went. Yeah. And fantastic. And I, you know, we could talk for hours about that particular aspect because that, yeah. that lack of follow up, that lack of, we can talk about that in a little bit. We'll come back to that. So just when you got started eight years ago, so you've kind of alluded to it, but Travis, what did you personally want from your business from day one? Like, what was that going to be? I know you've talked about you wanted to create something different. You wanted to impact people's lives, but what was this business going to give you from day one? I think everyone from, I think we all have our own dreams and aspirations. Um, and I think that comes from childhood. When I look back for me, when I was growing up, you know, my dad was a successful entrepreneur and, you know, unfortunately he passed away in my teens and I always had this sort of thing. It's like, I'm going to make a million dollars by the time I'm 30 and I'm going to change lives. Um, and I, I never had a, I never shied away from work ethic or anything like that. And I sort of was sitting there at 26 and I'm like, you're full of crap. You aren't going to you know, make a million dollars and you aren't going to change all the lives that you said you're going to change. Like you, what you're currently doing isn't serving the world um, mm. or you the amount that you should be serving. So I was like, okay, I need to step it up. I need to sort of, you know, step out of being mediocre, mediocre and step out of mediocrity and move into, you know, more of an achiever. So, you know, step one was two sixteen members and I, I wanted a lifestyle. I wanted a better lifestyle. I think that's what everyone wants with business. They want more time, more money, more freedom. Um, but I think you just have to, I don't think that was the biggest driver. It was the biggest driver for me. It was, the, it was a bit of a chip on the shoulder at the start. Like mm -hmm. going, you know, people say you can't do this. I'll prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, service, right? I wanted to change more lives. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. those two things, the chip on the shoulder and the service were the biggest two things. And Yeah. Yeah, and that chip on the shoulder and that really, that can be a huge driver for people, can't it? Yeah, it's like as soon as yeah. someone says you can't, it's like, yes, I can, watch me. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. I think the chip gets you so far and then you get to a point, I think it was like four or five gyms in, 
And I was like, you know, the chip didn't serve me anymore. I was like, yeah, I've done it. Like, you know, whatever you say, I really don't care anymore. Um, and then it moved into more of a contribution thing. So, you know, we always have these drivers. I think once you take care of yourself, it's like, okay, cool. Now I, I am here to serve on a larger, larger basis. So I think, you know, some people get to that stage and some people still just like, you know, doing that lifestyle business. So for me, I was like, no, now I want 10,000 members. Um, I want to change 20,000 lives. And I think that's our goal at the moment is we're moving towards changing 20,000 lives. And what does that mean? Well, we need 50 locations and that's our you know, next goal that we're looking at by 2022. Wow. Um, and you always have to have this, you know, we have away from motivation and towards motivation mm. at the start of the business. I think we all have a bit of a way from motivation. We want to get out of pain. Um, and then we also might have like thoughts in our mind. It's like, I want more freedom and a lifestyle business. So I can sit in the beach in Fiji and drink pina coladas. Um, but then we're like, Oh yeah, that's actually not what I want. Um, <laughs> not. And it, <laughs> yeah. and there's only so many pina coladas in fact that you can drink. So yeah, yeah. exactly. So that big why that sort of changing lives, helps helping people really yeah. live a better life is, is the underpinning that once yeah. that other kind of get the freedom, get the money, you know, like you said, after the third or fourth gym, you know, that, that big why has to be what drives, doesn't it? Yeah. It has to be this wildly important goal. Like for me, we have a hundred staff at the moment and, you know, wow. for me, I get to look after a hundred people in that business, their life. And then, mm. you know, they show up every day to fulfill my dreams. Um, which is crazy, right? So it's like, you know, you need to lead them, you need to inspire them, you need to make sure that they feel like every moment they're spending on your business or our business is worthwhile. So, you know, it's leadership on a deeper basis. And I feel like, you know, it's impacting the industry for me, but it's there, my, from them, I get to impact thousands of lives. Um, so I really got to look after them. I think that's the, the wildly important goal at the moment. And, and I love what you say there because one of the things, you're not just impacting those 100 people, you're impacting their partners, their children, their parents, their, they've all got family members and how they get treated in your business just ripples out into the, their families and beyond. So, you know, that's, that I've, I've always believed that how we treat people that work with us is, is just has this lovely rippling effect out into the bigger community. So, so true. So, this is a question um, about when did it feel like your business was real? So, you you know, you're walking around, you're asking people in the park, you're offering people in. At what point did you go, oh, wow, now I have a business? When did it feel like what was the point? Um, the, I think there's this line in the sand. Um, mm. there, there's this line in the sand. I was six months into um, the business and I knew I needed to become better as a business uh, marketer and a mm. business operator. And, you know, I've always been good at, like, you know, if you use the term hustling or whatever it is, um, I'll use that terminology. Um, I was always good at, like, hustling away to make a couple of hundred thousand dollars, and that's fine. But, um, you know, six months in, I was like, I need to start to get smarter at this business. Mm. And I need to start to, rather than, you know, just work harder, work smarter. I saw this mentor in the States. Um, and he was fantastic at marketing. He had some great operations. He had this, um, essentially everything that I needed, except I didn't have the cash flow at that time to, you know, pay him as a mentor. So what I looked at was, I was like, okay, how do I, like, he was running this competition and, you know, it was whoever could represent his blog, his website, the best over the, over the next month, won a year of mentoring, mastermind catch-ups. And I was like, okay, I'm going to win. And I just sort of sat there, I'm like, how are we going to do this? There was people in, you know, in Paris holding up signs in front of the Eiffel Tower with his website on it. It was pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, from that, I was like, okay, I'm just going to tattoo myself. And I tattooed his website on the back of my shoulder. So I've got this tattoo across the back of my shoulder with this guy's website. I took a photo. I sent it in. He's like, man, you are crazy. Um, he's like, but you win. Like you win. Because <laughs> um, no one else is crazy enough to do that. And like, I, I think that in that moment right there and then, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to be successful. Yeah. Um, I'm willing to do anything to succeed that mm -hmm. some people might call crazy. But starting a business in the first place is crazy. You have a 96% chance of failure. Like Absolutely. just starting it is crazy. So you may as well go all in crazy. 
<laughs> well, we're not suggesting everybody touch Sandy's <laughs> people's websites, but well, congratulations! That must have been amazing yeah. to have his mentorship and that. Yeah, that, like I was. Mm. Uh, yeah, I was in like a mentor. I was in a mastermind with Bill Phillips, who was doing you know tens of millions of dollars with Body for Life. Um, I was in like wow. I was just. You know, when you look at, again, the sum of the five people, I was yes. surrounded by people doing 10, 20, 30 million dollars. And then if you're around this and you can see what's possible, sometimes, you, you know, you have that belief structure inside your brain changes. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm actually playing small. You know, what I thought was big is actually small. So, you know, these small goals that I have, I just have to go A, B and C and I've achieved it. Um, and it started, then that was the process. I'm like, okay everything I ever thought was crazy isn't crazy and I can achieve these 216 members and it took me the next six months and I achieved it and then you know six months after that I opened the second gym and it was just like this rolling momentum forward after that because you know I think you have a deeper belief inside yourself that hey you know we have infinite like infinite possibilities inside this earth and you know for us all we have to do is tap into our true potential and then we can achieve it yeah, absolutely. No, I couldn't agree. And there's nothing like being exposed to the scale and the size of America to actually make us realise just what is potentially possible. Yeah. So, so true. Yeah. So the customers that you've got, and you, you knew that this gym model that was over there that eight years ago with the 80% never showing up and paying their money. And But how do you know people want what you're offering? How do, how do you know that they're, well, like obviously you've got eight gyms and you've got 10,000 members, but how do you know this is what they want? Um, I think it's always a, a constant evolution. Because before I opened the gyms, I've been in the fitness industry for eight years. So I've been in the industry for oh, seven years. So I've been in the industry for like 15 years now. Um, so I feel like it's nearly half my life. I've been trying to get yeah, people healthy. Yeah. Um, so, but for me, it's always trying to have some level of emotional intelligence to understand, are we doing the right thing? It's also cutting the model off at the right times that we, when we feel like we're going in the wrong direction, there's been evolutions mm-hmm. a long time. So mm-hmm. we had two sessions a week instead of four sessions a week. And a couple of years ago, we were going, okay, the results we we're getting with people um, that were two sessions a week were subpar to those who were training four times a week. Mm-hmm. So out of integrity even though we had people paying it and they said we can't pay the higher one the higher fee we cut the whole whole part of our business model because we weren't truly serving those people and because of that how the members that did stay with us got better results and we then you know more members came in so we, I think sometimes you, you can't be afraid to you know stick to your guns out of your own integrity um, if you can back that up but like mm-hmm. you know, back that up we knew that you know our core market is the males sort of 27 to 37 sort of corporate um that's for the females and we know that you know they have the the cash we also know that they have they want to feel good and look good we also know the way we can communicate with them that they have these stresses that they have in their life's life that we can go okay this is how you manage stress this is how you manage with meditation this is how you manage with training this is also how you manage with nutrition so it's we Mm -hmm. we live by truly an educated and empower business models so they feel good by coming towards us because we're empowering them to be better people mm-hmm. um so like that's who we are there and then we have the com- competitive edge with you know the males at 27 to 37 who used to play sports they they used to essentially train hard but they stopped playing sports whether it be injury or anything like that mm-hmm. so they come into rbt to be inside a group environment still which is everyone's pushing to pushing to you know become stronger to become lean to become fitter so inside this group environment that they miss um, because again, like human psychology doesn't, doesn't change. Like we always yeah. want to be a part of a tribe. Yep. So, we're tribal. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so you're so, providing yeah. so much more than just a gym. A gym. Yeah. yeah so. exactly. It's like we're community driven for us. So it's like looking at our core values. It's like, how can we manufacture tribal communities? And then for us now, like, you know, we have, you know, where there's nine, I'm sitting in Melbourne um, where I am. There's nine or 10, I think, locations in Melbourne right now. And we have inter-club games on, a, on a, essentially a mm. four-month basis. So mm. tribes come together and compete against each other, right? <laughs> and that's that's who we are. We, we want to win. We want to be the winning tribe. We want to get stronger. We want to represent. So, like, you know, we're looking at human needs. There's significance and connection. There's growth. There's contribution. There's variety. There's certainty. So we make sure we get that. And then all of a sudden, we also have these tribal leaders inside our gym. So, you know, they're members that when new members come in, they can welcome them. They can welcome them to be a part of our tribe. Um, I think 
it's if anyone just starts a business and they go, oh yeah, when in a group environment like this, or I'm just going to start a Pilates business, I'm just going to start a, a yoga business. Like, no, you're starting a tribe yes. and you are the tribal leader. Um, your staff are tribal leaders. And if you want to step back from the business, you need to promote another leader of your business. Otherwise I'll look for someone else who was a strong leader because yep. society, society is just silently begging to be led. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're waiting for you to lead them. And, and yeah, no, couldn't agree more. Fantastic. Um, I want to join your gym. I'm not a gym. I'm not, I'm, I'm not really a gym girl now, but I, if, I, I'll have to investigate if there's one in Sydney. Um, yeah. So we heard a little bit about your funding in the early day. You sold your car, you asked 51 and then the 52nd yeah. person said yes. Was that it? Was that how you funded the business? You just oh, I had a couple of crazy things. Then, yep. Yeah, I think you've got to think outside the box. Um, yeah. I think that's a big thing with business always. Um, and, you know, for myself, um, I've always had some form of personality on social media, whether it be my personal Facebook page, you know, people started following me because I started posting just like content all the time before people started posting content. But when I first started, you know, yep, I, I got 25000 in, yep, I sold my car. And then four months in, I still couldn't pay the rent. So I was like, you know, you have your first month's rent. Like I, I negotiated for three months free and my first month came around. I was like, I still couldn't pay the rent. I, my walking the streets hadn't grown the business to big enough yet. Yet. um but you know i was like okay cool how do i do this i need twelve thousand dollars in 14 days and i think like you know you have a will and there's will and fate sometimes they align together and if you have a strong enough will then sort of fate sometimes works for you as well so i, I went reached out to like groupon back then and i was oh, like yeah. i want to do a an offer i don't want to do it for my services which is the training but i want to do it for um an infrared sauna so infrared sauna helps do for toxification helps a, a variety of other benefits and i was like they said to me uh you don't have a website i was like okay hold on i went back built a website because you know back then there wasn't any landing pages and all this sort of stuff you had to do everything from scratch so yeah. somehow i figured out how to build websites back then as well um so it's like build this website you're putting up i pulled a bunch of pictures off um uh, Google and I was like, hey, look, this is my infrared saunas. Um, you know, it's eight sessions a week for nine, 80 sessions a month, eight sessions a month for $97. And they're like, okay, cool. We'll put it up. And there was like, you know, at this stage, it was 12 days left and I needed to bring in $12,000. And if I didn't, I would have been basically kicked out of the gym and my dream was over before it started and everyone would have been right. Like, you know, again, fate, and will i never even owned an infrared sauna right now so i was literally selling the dream um on these groupons that went out there um it said you had to wait two weeks before you could actually activate this this uh this deal um we sold twenty one thousand dollars worth of deals over the next oh, 10 days habits. crazy I know, cra crazy. It was like 800 deals got sold. Um, my my cut as a business was 15,000 of that 21,000. You know, I got that like two days before we had to pay the rent. Um, I paid 12,000 to rent. I called up this business, J and H Saunas. I was like, I need a sauna to express deliver it to me now. And I paid them two thousand dollars for that, and I, and I had another thousand dollars in my pocket. And I was I was there to survive another month. So. Again, it's kind of like gambling a little bit, but like I knew I, it was going to work. When I first started the business again, like I think some people were like, oh, I need all this funding. No, sometimes you need to look at outside the box. Mm -hmm. So I went to a, a, I was like, who's a new business or gym provider in the marketplace? And I went to this guy called Simon. He's actually not in business anymore, but I was like, you're new into the industry. I'm new into the industry. You're getting equipment from China. Um, I want your equipment. I can't get financing, but I'll pay you cash each month for 12 months. And if I miss a payment, just take the equipment off me. So yeah. then I, like, I didn't even have to finance my equipment. I just had to pay for it cash. So that's how I got my equipment for the gym. You know, four months in, I couldn't pay the, the rent. I was like getting there, but I couldn't pay the rent again. So I reached out to a friend. I was like, you know, I need to borrow $12,000. I'll pay you $24,000 back in 12 weeks. Um, huge ROI for him. And if I don't, just take the, take the equipment and sell the equipment. I was like, screw it anyway. So like, I, I, then I made the $12,000 back. I paid him off. And my first four months, like that's, that was me. I was just doing whatever it took. Um, 
and looking you know, after I, clients as well and yeah. finding clients that yeah yeah you're yeah <laughs> i know right I, I tried this thing called like monophasic sleeping at one stage i was like <laughs> i was like i need more time of the day how do i find more time of the day i was like monophasic sleeping is like you sleep 20 minutes and you're awake for four hours and then you sleep 20 minutes 20 and minutes. that's how you live you don't have a night time so i was like that's how i get more hours in the day i did it for like 10 days and then i passed out i was like i thought i was going to die i passed out for a day and a half and everyone was like where is he gone i was like well, luckily it was over the weekend like you know he hasn't been on social media for like 12 hours i think he could be dead um but I was, <laughs> no like, he was just like, sleeping off his, just, his yeah, marathon sleeping off his sleep debt. yeah oh, so i was dude. like okay that's that's not for me i, I stopped doing monophasic sleeping and yeah i think so. start to, yeah, but you start to work on, okay, how can I be more productive? And that's when I search for that mentor. It's was yeah. like, how can I get better at my, time, at my marketing? How can I get better with my productivity? How can I get better at all at my sales? How can I keep um, using the philosophy of Kaizen, like the 1% every week across all my different areas to improve yeah. the margins, to improve the business? And that's essentially you know, where the first bunch of money was coming from inside yeah. um, RBT. It was just thinking outside the box. Yeah. And, you know, I think people feel constrained by just either funding or, you know, borrowing money or going to the bank or something. And there's so many other ways of doing it. Okay. So while we're talking about money, how did you in the early days and then how do you now, and you don't have to actually tell us how much yeah, it costs yeah. to come to the gym, but how do you decide a pricing strategy? How do you know how much to charge your people? You said there about the two sessions and the four sessions. Yeah. So talk um, about pricing, please. It, 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 it's a bit of a tough one, right? Like for us, mm. obviously we look at our margins. Um, mm. We're just going through a pricing restructure at the moment. So, you know, we, we were at 97 for some locations. We were at 77 for some locations. Um, at the 77, where we have good margins at capacity, but not until capacity, we don't. So we're actually pushing it back to, you know, just looking at a 30% margin all the way from like 100 members up to 150, up to 100, uh, up to 200. And it's looking at the employees that we're hiring at that point as well. Mm. So I think that 84.95 for us, having 30% 30, 30 margins is key. So sometimes, you know, we know we're good at what we do. We're more expensive than the other places around us, like us, mm. but we don't really care. For us, we needed to be profitable whilst holding a leadership team because we're not franchise based. So we have internally this leadership team that you know we distribute the cost of that across the locations as well. So our you know costs are slightly higher at each location. I think um, the it's not really when you're looking at what you're going to charge dictated on what the market is currently paying. It's mm. dictated on what you need to charge based on your infrastructure um, yeah. and. If it's twenty dollars more a week than the competitors, okay, then just be better at your experience. Because yeah. people pay a thousand dollars for a burger in a yeah. thousand pounds for a burger in London, and they also pay like you know two dollars for a, chi a Big Mac, right? So it's yeah. like you know if there's people to pay on the extremes, as I was like, I looked the other day, it's like there's literally a place in London that does a thousand pounds for a kebab. But there's yeah. also, you know, three pounds yeah. of abs. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's the experience you deliver that dictates how much you can charge. And then it's going, okay, what's the business model? What like sits true with me? And for us, it's like we wanted one-on-one -on -one support. We wanted to deliver that experience. So for us, and then we, we work our margins first, and that's what our price works out to be. So it's understanding your margins and your cash flow. Yeah. So what do you say? And this, this isn't, this is a question without notice. So a lot of people, so you're more expensive than your, yeah. um, you know, your competition. What, what do you do when someone says mm, you're expensive or that's expensive? How do you respond to that? Or how does your team, how are they trained to respond to when someone says that's expensive? Like it's, it's easy, right? Like for us, like, you know, Qantas is more expensive than Tiger. Okay, like um, a Rolex is more expensive than a Casio. Um, yeah. A Lamborghini is more expensive than a Datsun. Yeah. You know, so that goes back to get... what you said about the customer experience. It's yeah. The experience that they it's get. just the experience is like, for yeah. sure, like, do you want certainty that you're going to get to your result? Because that's what we provide. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. Can't, like we give you 100% certainty that we'll get your result or your money back. Yeah. So, we, we, we give you that certainty. It's like, yeah, for sure. Like, you know, when there's, there's first class, there's business class and there's economy. Are you the type of person who likes to sit in economy? Do you want the leg room? You yeah. know, do you want the personalized approach? Or, yeah. you know, do you want to be guessing your way along there? It's like, I hope I'm doing it right. It's yeah. like, if you want the guesswork taken out, of, out from you, if you want to keep you kept accountable, if you're sick of yo-yo dieting, if you want to learn how to keep this for life, then this is probably, we're probably a good fit for you. 
more mm. been to the gym for the last three years. How much have you spent by not coming to our gym when you could have achieved that in six months? Yeah. So yeah. you could have had the last two and a half years with more confidence, the last two and a half years feeling better about yourself. The last two and a half years, you probably would have got a pay rise because of the confidence you would have got if you joined us three years ago. So it's like, Travis, I lose, love you. <laughs> yeah, like you're, you're losing fantastic. money. Yeah. yeah, you're losing yeah. money. You're losing money doing. doing what you're doing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. start so spending I, a bit more and get over here. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's also like people go, oh, I'm not sure if I'm willing to pay that. And it's like even with business consulting as well, right? It's like, oh, you're expensive. And it's like, yeah, if you can't afford it, that's why you need to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you mm-hmm. know, when someone starts to put more money on the table, they actually take you more seriously. Um, so when you're looking at a gym and you're like, Oh, I'm going to charge $30 a week. So it's, so it's more affordable. I was like, okay, well, you're also making it easier for them to not care about it as well. It's like, I'd rather charge a hundred bucks a week. And they're like, Oh Jesus, that's, that's really expensive for me. I'm going to take this really seriously. Then Mm it's like, yeah, I want you to take it seriously. Mm-hmm. Because that means you actually listen to what I say. It means you follow the nutrition advice. It's going to turn up to the sessions. So yeah. when some people see it as a hindrance, I see it as an advantage because we're making people more conscious of their choices because they're, you know every dollar counts. Every dollar counts. And they know that they've got that commitment. And you're holding them accountable because you follow them up if they're not showing up. So, yeah. yeah. So okay. I think it's, it's, it's crucial to understand that. Like pricing is crucial to, to <laughs> not try and go, if I compete on price, I lose on price. Just yeah. always remember that. Yeah. Say it again for everyone who just maybe was <laughs> distracted by <laughs> throwing a ball for their dog while they were listening to the podcast. If you compete on price, you will lose on price. There's always someone willing to come into the marketplace and probably has more money than you who is willing to do it cheaper than you. So yeah. if that was your angle in your business growth, that is going to be your essentially downfall in your business growth. Yeah, but price is never something to compete on. It really isn't. Yeah. And certainly not for health professionals because so many health professionals do what they do because they want to help people. They want to make a difference. And, you know, selling that cheap you can't help anyone when you're sleeping in the car yeah. under a bridge or, you know, like that's yeah. just, you, you're just not. And if you're constantly stressed about money, it really impacts how well then a health professional can actually deliver what they're doing. You know, the money exactly. has to be gone. Yeah. So, okay. So an exit strategy, it doesn't sound like you have one, but you don't have to tell <laughs> us what it is, but have you, like when you get, is yeah. there, like what, what so, happens so, so, down the track? Yeah, for us, it, it's it's a good one. Like for us, you know, we're going to get to the 50 locations in Australia and then we'll focus on the US again. Um, I think, you know, I, I, want it, I want it to be a $100 million company. I think that's a yeah. big thing for me. It's like, it's not just because it's a number. I think for us, a $100 million company will probably be about 130 gyms. It means we get to, you know, those $100 million company, 130 gyms means we're changing about 30,000 lives every single year. We're actually like making an impact. Um, you know, when we look at it, you know, they said, I think it's like 66% by 2022, 66% of the adult population is going to be overweight or or obese and 40% of children. Um, so like it, it, I I find that is scary. Yeah. Really scary. It's kind of a bit disgusting as well. I'm like, I feel like, oh my gosh, we're going in the wrong direction. Um, so, you know, we're, we're launching some initiatives to bring in kids for free at the four to five o'clock mark so we can start to educate the next generation. Fantastic. And for me, it's yeah. not just about, you know, it's not about cash. It's about, okay, cool. If I have 130 gyms, that means I can, you know, run 460 campaigns for the kids running for six weeks for free each year. And that means great over those 460 kids, I can impact about 10,000 children every single year. And that's the next wave. It's educating yeah. them to empower them to have yeah. better lives and the ripple effect that you talked about earlier. Like it's, that's, that's why I'm in this industry. Yeah. And you know, Travis, the smoking thing was actually driven by children, the non-smoking, yeah. like children, children were, they went into schools and they taught children what smoking was doing to their parents. And that, that generation of parents stopped smoking because their children spoke to them about, it wasn't a campaign from the government that told the parents, it was the children. So you could have the same impact with the children to their parents about healthier eating. And, you know, it's just phenomenal what we can do. I was at a, 
um, a conference recently that Michelle Obama spoke at. And, you know, she talked about how many people in America, I mean, it's the same percentages. It's it's hundreds of millions of people who are unhealthy, yeah. who, and that, but the strain that is going to be on their lives, on their families, and then on the health system and beyond, yeah. it's just like, it's, it really is. And there's more than enough, anyone who's worried that their business, there is more than enough clients for everybody because such a tiny percentage of people actually come to health, to gyms, to those well, sorts of things. That's the thing. Like people say to me, oh, but aren't you worried about competition? I'm like, no, please no, bring no. more competition because, yeah. you know, especially in the States, like for us in Australia, there's, you know, that's why we'll, there's 23, 24 million or whatever it is in Australia at the moment. And we'll get to our yeah. 50 gyms. Um, yeah. Like there is 30 million people in LA. Yeah. <laughs> like, we to, oh, no, like we have to go to America because like yeah. that's we have to impact more lives over there. Like yeah. we have to grow over there. And it's like the impact we could have if we're doing fifty in Australia, we could do fifty in LA. And yeah. still, like there's, and, and there's there. still people left over. <laughs> yeah. So it's okay. crazy, like competition yeah. is nothing you should nothing. ever be worried about. No, absolutely. Um something you wish you'd done differently at the beginning. So let's be a bit reflective. You've you've eight yeah. years is if you had to say something you'd rather you'd done differently, what would it be? Um, I think, you know, I, I'm an emotional person. Um, <laughs> I'm a cancerian. I don't know if that means anything, but I think I feel like I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Mm. So I think like, I felt like I got let down a few times by people. Mm. Um, and it, it, I think it's being more reflective earlier on. So it's like, and taking more ownership sometimes earlier on and also understanding and empathizing and having compassion earlier on as well. So it's like when someone makes a decision whether to leave me or, you know, know, whether it be steal from me or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, like what are they going through? Like Mm -hmm. let's change perspective. Um, Mm -hmm. Let's sit down and go, okay, maybe I shouldn't. Anger and stress never actually give you a positive outcome. But empathy and compassion can or yeah. just, you know, sitting down and asking more questions without emotion involved at all. Yeah. Um, it's like Viktor Frankl talks about, he wrote the, a book, A Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and I was probably one, of, I wish I had read that earlier on as well. Like, mm-hmm. you know, he talks about this stimulus and response and expanding the gap between the stimulus and to the response. So, you know, you can choose the better quality emotion or you can choose the better action from that stimulus because so many of us think these stimulus is predetermine the response. Like, someone steals from you, you must get angry. It's like, you know, you don't have to get angry. You could be empathized. You could be compassionate or you can reflect. It's like, why did they feel like they needed to steal from me? You know, how did I fail them as a leader? Or how did they not really understand our business model? Or, you know, why, you know, like how could I have connected with them better? So sometimes, yeah, it's not right to do that. But like sometimes if we can reflect and we take some form of ownership, it takes the emotion out of it, which allows you to have better quality thinking, better creative thinking and better quality actions from that. I think that's the biggest thing I would tell myself. Mm. And that's true. It's not easy to learn how to the stimulus response because so I mean yeah. so much of the monkey brain, the reptilian brain, it's it's happened before you've even realised that. Yeah, it's- and I'm a male, so where does it work? Oh dear. Okay, so slightly different question, and this is more around the business. And and I am going to put the Victor Frankel book in the because I think yeah. that's a really good piece, and especially if people are listening to this heading into the summer holidays. You know, yeah. it might not be everybody's idea of the perfect book to read, but I, you know, it's a it's a really good reflective sort of book. And um, thank you for mentioning that one. Yeah. Is there something you wish you'd known from the start? Um, it, if somebody, you know, you eventually went to your mentor, you, you know, you had that year with him. If, if there was some knowledge that you could have had from the beginning. I think it's knowing cash flow earlier. I think cash flow is such a big thing for me. Like um, now, you know, I, I didn't really look at it as much and I'm not the biggest on cash flow. I have the right people though where I have with cash flow now. Yeah. Um, but also I think earlier on, like something I wish I knew is, you know, you can, hire talent or you can grow talent and understanding the right time to hire talent and when the right time to grow talent is also i think like those two things are are such a crucial thing like if you you have money you know you can buy talent if you don't have money you have to grow talent and growing talent does take longer uh, mm-hmm. But you can still create more loyalty. The other, other way, it doesn't really matter. It's just like, what do I need right now in my business? And there's been certain times where I've had to buy talent to stabilize different yes. gyms. And then other times I've had to grow talent to create better communities within the gym. Mm-hmm. So it's like, mm-hmm. it's having that 
key distinguishing understanding. It's like, when should I do either one of those? And then looking at the cash flow side of things, it's like, okay, you know, you, you don't just make decisions on a whim. It's like you need to project and plan and making sure that we're, we're, we're hitting our 90 day milestones or we're hitting our six month or year milestones. So yeah, are we truly on track? And I think yeah. that's the key thing as well. It's like, it's not just like top line, um, gross revenue, but it's like, okay, what was our net profit or what's our percent of, um, you know, wages yeah. or what's yeah. our percent of marketing? And so many people, particularly health professionals and people who are in the sort of creatives and caring industries, talk about not being numbers people. Oh, I'm not really a numbers person, which is actually rubbish because you're dealing with numbers all the time. How much do people weigh? How much weight do they lift? Yeah. You know, how many reps do they do? So, so it's actually, it's really just another form of numbers, isn't it? Okay, so your mentor was a great assistance to you. Who else has been of assistance and who can give you good feedback? Who gives you really great feedback? I think my wife gives me probably the best feedback. Like we are, we're a sounding board for each other every single Friday night on date night. We'll just have a recap of the week and then we sort of stop talking about work. But we always, you know, we're our best. Nice. Uh, nice. We're our best uh, counterparts. I think, you know, we're kind of opposites at the same time so we can reflect on different things. I think without her, we definitely wouldn't be where we're at as a company. Um, she grounds me and she, she is probably one of the smartest people I know. So she, she definitely is the biggest help for me. Mm. I think then it's looking at um, our teams. I think our teams mm. in every team, they give the best feedback and you have to be open and honest with feedback as well. So you have to go, mm. okay, this is, you know, this is whatever it is, a certain day of the week, you're doing your feedback time and you go, okay, cool. This is a non-emotional feedback time, guys. I'm going to tell them something to you, you know, each of you, okay, that I need better from you over the last seven days. And you're going to tell everyone gives everyone a piece of feedback. Mm. So constantly we can be coming better as, as teams. We can become better as a leadership team or we can become better as individual teams, which strengthens the culture. Because if so many times in business, people are afraid to speak up. They're mm. afraid to tell something that um, if they feel like is going wrong. And if you don't tell people that something's going wrong, then all of a sudden it's like small um, mm -hmm. little, like itch, mm -hmm. and this massive like, mm -hmm. like an ulcer essentially like that. Mm -hmm. like, it feels mm -hmm. debilitating at times. So I think having a set time each week with your team where you're doing open and honest, non-emotional feedback. Um, I say non-emotional because feedback isn't emotional. It's just mm -hmm. what, what people they're giving you that it can be emotional, but you need to take the emotion out of it so you can have um, yeah. essentially constructive conversations. I think those two. I've had like seven or eight mentors over the last. You know, eight years, you know, I've, I've sold multiple cars to try and pay for mentors, <laughs> flying to the States or done it all. Um, yeah. Some mentors were great and some mentors weren't, but the ones that weren't, I, I'll learn something from. The ones that are great, I'll learn two things from. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, it's constantly, um, you know, Tony Robbins would say, right, it's like constant never-ending improvement. Yeah. Uh, if, you, yeah. if you look at yourself uh, with uh, the humility or being humble enough to go, every single moment I can learn something from anyone, um, whether it be a mentor or the janitor or whatever it is, like, you know, you have to be open to learning. And if you're closed off to learning, that means, okay, cool, maybe you have a bit of an ego problem. Yeah. Um, like yeah. Your ego to the side and be humble enough to learn from anyone and everyone. And if anyone gives you feedback, it's valid. Um, you look at it, you reflect on it, you move forward. I think mm -hmm. that. And also the last one I would say is um, myself. I think feedback for myself. So if you journal on a daily basis, I would recommend everyone should be journaling on a daily basis. Ask yourself a question each morning. You know, mm. you know, how can I be a better person? Or what would I need to do to reach my true potential? Or, you know, ask yourself a question. About it. It's like, what, if I had to do three things to increase my member experience, what would I do? Mm. Or if I was one thing I could implement to be a better leader to X person, what would that one thing be? And so many times we have these, the answers inside of us. We don't quieten our mind enough and spend 20 minutes or 30 minutes just reflecting on specific questions because you have the answers. It's just you're constantly in a reactive state. Yeah. So you can't be proactive to give yourself that feedback. Travis, that is just music to my ears because, you know, one of the things that I've been sort of observing is how much everybody watches everybody else and you can't have an original thought while you're busy watching what everyone else is doing and there's always going to be somebody prettier, taller, with better videos. There's stop watching around. Like just keep your eye on the – on like, yeah, thank you. That's I love what you just said there. Thank I think you. It's, it's hard, right? We compare so much right now because of Instagram, because of Facebook, because of everything, right? 
And we forget, like I started doing YouTube videos um, mm. about eight years ago now. And I look mm. back to some of my first ones, I'm like, oh, <laughs> so terrible. But like, and I'm still not the best. That's okay. Like, but I'm on my journey. Yeah. And every amateur, okay, every athlete was once an amateur. And, you know, you, you might have been an amateur or you might be an athlete right now, but you're on your journey. And all you can compare is you to yesterday or you to last year. And I think as entrepreneurs, we don't reflect enough. And it's not just patting yourself on the back for the financial wins, but it's patting yourself on the back for the person you're becoming along the way. If you can't truly feel the enjoyment in the process on your way to your million dollars, $2 million, $20 million, whatever it is for you, like the process is where all the learnings happen. The process is where the fun is. The process is where the excitement is. The process mm. is who you needed to become to mm. get that end goal. And if you're not excited about that, it's like, geez, like, good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. So three characteristics, and, I, you know, the listeners know I ask this question about the characteristics that you have. Um, we could probably sum them up ourselves right now but what do you think your three characteristics are that make you successful you talked about being sensitive you're ambitious like what what are your three characteristics um i think i asked myself this a little bit right i think you know the traits we internally do to ourselves is how what we project i think we are our worst uh own worst critic um Mm -hmm. as you were talking about before like we're so self-critical as a society right now i'm not good looking enough i can't sell well enough i'm not good enough is what the statement we say to ourselves so much uh, i think my my key trait first is like respect i have to respect myself first and i can respect nice. others. i think mm. that's a key thing right another key thing is inspiration right like you know you know inspiration is essentially for amateurs but i believe that inspiration i need to inspire myself in in, in a moment to moment basis and you know i've got a lot of stuff going on at the moment um i need a I need to center myself with a bit of inspiration, even like before this podcast, right? It's like, okay, bring me back to my why, you know, get myself in the right moment, in the right state, and I inspire myself. And then, okay, now conversation, hopefully that I can inspire others. Or, you know, before I have a conversation with everyone, my staff or in my team, it's like, okay, you need to center myself. What state do I need to be in? Okay, I can inspire someone because I want every conversation and to leave feeling like they were better off for communicating with me. So I think respect is the big one. I think, you know, inspiration is the next one. I think courageous is the next one Mm. because courage is what people truly want. And it's not that you are fearless. Like it's not that you're fearless as a leader. It's that you just simply fear less. Okay. I think it's a big distinction there. It's not that you're Mm. fearless as a leader. It's you just simply fear less because you took the chance to open the business despite the 96% failure. You took the chance to try and grow your business, even though it's only 2% of businesses make a million dollars. Like you simply feared less than yes. the rest of society to take the chance. And that's what your staff see in you. They're giving you years of their life. We only have one life and they're giving you years of that because you are their courageous leader and if you aren't courageous, they'll find another courageous leader to lead them. Yeah. So courage, inspiration, and respect. I think those three things, and if you can tie that in to charisma, um, <laughs> like you, you have to be some form of charismatic to get your, your to communicate effectively. Right, mm. like, and I'm not saying oh, you must be this charismatic person, but I think you know everyone is charismatic in their own authentic way, and mm. you know you'll find the staff inside your business that are in line with your authenticity. Um, so I think you know being charismatic in your way, not trying to project and be like someone else, but being who you need to be. I think that's charisma. Yeah, and that comes back to that you being who you are, not looking yeah. like don't be this person over here. Yeah. No, lovely. Yeah. Last question, Travis, and I, I just this, um, I'm just so you, you ha- are very charismatic. I'd have to say, <laughs> I, 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 this has been the most delightful interview. Thank you. <laughs> so someone comes along to you, and I know that this happens to you on a regular basis, and says, you know what, I just want to start my own business. What do you say to them? Are you sure? <laughs> like no seriously it's like are you sure like are you sure this is what you want to do yeah because for the next like for me like i'm eight years in and you know for the and, it's, and i didn't take a wage for the first six and a half years not because wow. um 
I couldn't take away just because I wanted to pour everything back into the business. Yeah. So for me, I still wear two dollar t-shirts. I wear fifty dollar jeans. Yeah. I wear twenty dollar shoes. Like you know, like uh, you know, it's not about you don't have a car because you, you sold it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if, if you're about instant gratification, yeah. If you're about security, if you're about certainty, like don't do the business. Mm-hmm. Like go get a job and work for someone. Yeah. Like that's okay as well because I think we, um, as a society right now, we put these entrepreneurs up on pedestals and we're like, oh, I need to be an entrepreneur. If not, I'm doing the wrong thing. And I, I think we're going to have over the next, over the coming years, like a lot of people, if I know now already, slipping into depression or feeling like a failure because yeah. they didn't live up to what Instagram said an entrepreneur should be, getting the likes on the posts and driving the Ferraris and having the big houses. Like that's yeah. not what an entrepreneur does. Like no. an entrepreneur wants to create impact. An entrepreneur, like you can't make money. Like you, I make money. <laughs> um, but like, like, like I'm putting my business money back into my business to yeah. try and grow it, to impact yeah. more lives. And, you know, if you want instant cash, like go buy some cryptocurrency at the right time. <laughs> like, yeah. like, I'm like so glad you're saying this, Travis, because, you know, I actually, I spent a lot of my life as an employee and I was a good employee and I contributed to those companies and you've got a hundred employees. I mean, people still have to be employees. So, yeah. you know, and it's honourable, it's honourable to be an employee and do a good job and take the money and look after your family and enjoy your life. Not everybody has to start a business, um, but, but let's get yeah. in the right headspace so that you can yeah. start a successful Yeah, business. like you could definitely can start the right, you can definitely start a business, but you don't have to start a business. I feel like a lot of people are a failure unless they don't. They think if mm. they don't start one right mm. now, and then they feel lost and they feel like they're mm. a failure even more because mm. they didn't get the instant cash that people say they're going to get. So yeah. like if you, if you really, if you really want to change your, know, the world, the industry, if you feel like your genius talent is going to impact more than the place down the road, by all means start the business. But before you do it, have you been in this industry yet? No, then go get a job part-time, go work as a casual person, yeah. understand that you truly love the business. If that gives you a, like this fire in your heart, it's like, yes, I want to do more and I want to do more and I want to do more. It's like, you found it. Yeah. And congratulations, you found yeah. it. Now pour your heart and your soul into that for the next five years because over the next five years, if you do that, then you're going to build something that truly changes lives. It's going to impact the world. And then if you want to keep growing that, keep investing in, but it's going to take the next five years to get to the, you know, the seven figures and you're going to start to, you know, build this legacy. And that's why I do it now. It's like I got two sons, right? Like I got a one and a four year old and I want to go like for them, like, you know, where you start in this world and where you finish you know, where you start doesn't determine where you finish. No. You get to decide. And, yeah. you know, success to me is being a good husband. My wife works for me. She's just over there. Success to me is being a good dad. And yeah. success to me is not business, right? Like, it's, a, it's some of who I am. And if I can build this to 130 gyms, like, awesome, right? It means I got to transform lots and lots of lives. But success, if the gyms went, like I have my wife and I have my kids still. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's success. Like it's being a person. It's, not, it's staying true to your values. I think, you know, like so many people want to start a business and I'm going on about this because they think that, oh, I want to start a business so I can be successful. It's like, no, just wake up this morning. Yeah. And just tell yourself yeah. you're successful when you are. Yeah. Like don't, you don't need a business to be successful. Mm. But if you want to impact more lives, yeah, for sure. And, and in your own business, you can, you can, and, yeah. and, and it can be in another person's business. You know, you've got a yeah. hundred people helping you. Impact. Yeah. Travis, I have no doubt in the world you are going to have 150 gyms. I have no doubt yeah. in the world you're going to have a thousand and fifty gyms. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. This Thank has you. Been, now, if people want to contact you, RBT, sorry, can I ask you why you've called it RBT? Because RBT has a certain yeah. meaning in a Yeah, story. random breath testing, right? So, yeah, it's called, it's like we, we're result-based training. So oh, results-based right. okay. training. Um, but we dropped the uh, we, we dropped the result-based training a couple of years ago and went RBT gyms. I get random screen captures on Instagram. It's like, oh, you're on TV because RBT is like on Channel 7 or whatever it is yeah. um, all the time. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, I know, we're on TV again. Um, but like we, we dropped in, we're RBT gyms now. Um, but it's just like, the, it's easier to say. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's like, and it's got that lovely world. little association with RBT yeah, as well. Exactly, exactly. It's like don't drink and drive. Uh, so <laughs> if if somebody wants to join, it's an RBT gym. They just need to find yeah, one nearby. RBT and then gym, the coaching gym, that you do yeah. as well. How would um, somebody contact you for that? I think the biggest thing is like find me on Instagram, Travis Jones Entrepreneur. If you just hit, reach out to me on Instagram, like I give two posts a day, every day of value on Instagram through my consulting side of things. Yep. Um, I truly want to educate people, empower them to live true to their values, understand sales and marketing on a deeper level. Um, I, you know, I, I post most of my stuff there as far as webinars coming up and, you know, how to grow with Facebook ads or Instagram or anything like that. So Travis Jones Entrepreneur on Instagram is probably the easiest way you'll find me right now. Right. Um, yeah, who who knows? Who knows? Yeah. That's right. Oh, well, um, from the listeners, I want to thank you very much for your time and it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I said it was going to be a fun interview and once Travis got going, well, he certainly has some strong opinions about business and what it takes to be successful from his point of view. I have no doubt in my mind that he will have 50 gyms in the not too distant future. He is determined to have an impact on health and well-being of as many people as he can. Don't you just love what he's going to be able to do for children and young people as well? You see, being successful gives all of us the ability to have more impact on the things that we believe in. You may want to go back and listen to parts of it again, or maybe you want to jump over to the website where there's a full transcription, healthynumbers.com.au and choose the podcast tab. All the podcast transcripts are there. And for everyone listening, whether this is your first episode or you've been with us for some time, I truly believe that whatever you're dreaming about can become real. These podcasts are designed to inspire, educate and inform you about what it takes to create, start and grow a business of your own. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to rate it on iTunes and leave your comments. We all know this helps with spreading the show to more people. Thank you. What questions do you have? How might I help you? Email me any questions, ingrid at healthynumbers.com.au and I will reply directly. I answer all my own email questions because it's important for what you need. As we say, ideas without action, well, that's just what they are, ideas. What action are you inspired to take today? Till the next time, thanks for listening.